the recording. All right, now we're recording, so we're ready to get started. Um, first thing, right now, how's the papers going? Good. Ready? All right. If you want to, um, this is for all students. So if you watch this lecture tonight, um, you can turn it in uh, to me in draft form, free, gratis. I will grade it, look at it, give you tips and that kind of thing to get you um, where you need to be, um, if anywhere, if any correction need to be made. So it won't count against you at all. Don't have to turn it in. Don't know what your schedules are like, but give if you get to me by Tuesday night because they're due on Thursday. Big reminder, flash, flash, flash. Most things are due on Sunday. The paper's going to be due on um, Thursday in my class. The PowerPoint presentation goes along with it. You in class students will present that for your points. Everybody else will turn that in. Um, probably won't have nothing but the presentations for that class, unless y'all have specific questions about the upcoming chapters. I'll record them like I did the first two I uh, didn't do this last one, but I'll record voiceover so everybody can have the material the same thing. But our last class will be hopefully three people presenting their PowerPoint or their paper. And uh, I want the Zoom students to come in and see that as well. If any Zoom student wants to um, present theirs, that's perfectly fine. They can do that as well. They don't have to then turn it in their normal format of getting their points. I just like the fact that if you're here to do some public speaking, it just helps. So again, Turn them in to me by Tuesday if you want a look at them. I recommend that because uh, uh, I can get you – be the difference between an A and a B maybe uh, of showing you where you need to be at and get you back on track. Um, if not, no, no big deal. If you turn it in to me and I don't have many corrections, but I'll just turn it to Word. You'll see the side blocks. You don't know how to read those. I'll be writing in that format on there. If you don't see many corrections, I'll tell you you've done really good. Don't be mad. It's not that I blew it off. You, you, you're good where I think you need to be. Um, uh, you just got it done early and got a little bit of a break on that, from that Thursday. But that way you get some feedback. So anyway, anyway, use that if you want to. By Tuesday, though, after Tuesday, because everybody turns them in on Tuesday night. That gives me all day Wednesday. And a paper usually takes me an hour, hour and a half per. So it's a lot of hours when they, if everybody turned them in at the same time. Still very doable. I'm not complaining at all. I'm just saying uh, I, I can't have them on Wednesday and really get you much of a product back and do it justice. So, um, and then your presentation is real simple PowerPoint per slides. Um, you turn that PowerPoint in, you'll get the max points for it. And I don't count off it being bad. I will give you tips on it because it's part of being a professional so that you know it's just not part of this class, but I'm not gonna miss the opportunity to grade those or give you help on those. I just think it's important, but I'm not gonna put it as part of the class, but it is participation points. So uh, everybody feeling okay so far about the class? Grades are looking pretty good. Um, Got a few people need to get caught up on some things, but other than that, I think we're rolling. Um, this is it for lecture. Uh, unless I, I have the lectures, if y'all come to class and want to do the lectures, I've not yet had a class yet that wanted to do them after they presented, because I put them in a format that you can see the lectures beforehand. Um, but if you want to go over the lectures or talk about them, I'd be glad to. It's your time. But typically, by the time we get through three presentations or so, you know getting close to time anyway but okay all right three of my most favorite chapters are coming up oh and I do apologize you will see probably tomorrow uh, um, you'll see it in the lecture and I'll try to get the slide deck up for chapter 15 I do not know what happened I'm going back and look and see 15 is not out there so I try to move it up there and it's not there it says 15 is there but it's empty Files empty. So I guess when I converted over the new laptop and the windows, that one did not. I don't know what it did. So I've got to rebuild that one. Just discovered that. Thought I had it out there. But just the same, we'll go over tonight. I got my book. I go over without it. So, but it'll be out there. All right, let's roll. Motivation and performance. Here we are. So, what is motivation? In your own words. It's when you want to do something. Yeah, exactly. When you want to do something. Is motivation in the business world important? Yes. Yeah, it's important in everything, but you think in the business world especially, right? 
talk about sports to get motivation and you know be motivated working out motivation work isn't that. so what's your role as a leader in motivation i mean is it just you that needs to be motivated if you're a leader yeah i need to be motivated because if you don't have motivation if me and her work together and she's down but i'm highly motivated we kind of make a great for a team because you're trying to be motivated for two people yeah Yep. And so whose responsibility is it to motivate the employees? Part B, yes. I would say so. You agree with that? You have employees? I, I, I say 50 50, 50 yourself and 50 managers. Sure. Sure. Yep. So sometimes managers don't do their part. Sometimes employees don't do their part. And sometimes neither do their part. And you see that at some places. Don't you hate going to those places where nobody's motivated? They want to be there. You probably had an experience in a retail store or a restaurant or somewhere where that's happened. I mean, we can all probably give an example of that. Uh, I'm sure it happens in businesses too. Uh, I just, those are the ones we get to go visit. We don't get to walk into most people's floor of their work and see that. So not picking on the service industry, but we've seen that. Then you've been in those places where they're like really motivated. Like nowadays I've noticed like everybody, of course they charge you a lot. So I know I walk into a place and they say, welcome to, Moe's or or David's or whatever it is I'm going to it's probably going to, they're all happy I'm happy price going to be more <laughs> than at Wendy's <laughs> you don't get a welcome to Wendy's or McDonald's usually but you get a welcome but you see that motivation right and that's what they're doing but they're 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 probably turning a little bit higher profit on their profit margin right by that motivation you can probably tell when it's fake too right and I walked into a firehouse one time and I had three people kind of go because I was the only person. So, welcome to firehouse. And normally they're really good. I think, I don't know what it was, but the three of them was like, we got to do something now. So they weren't really, really motivated to get me my, my hook and ladder. <laughs> so, um, but motivation is important. Why we're going to talk about it is because as managers, we're partly responsible, right? But you know, too, you can be the cheerleader all day long, right? And then sometimes people show up and there's not much to do for them. As far as the motivation part, then that's some other leadership things. So that's what the book says. The psychological forces that determine the direction of a person's behavior in an effort organization or a person's level of effort and a person's level of it persistence. I like the way you said it. That's the book and that's correct, but it's what you want to do, right? You got to want to. You got to have some desire. Explains why people behave the way they do in organizations and you've been you know those situations where no one's motivated or whatever or they're highly motivated you can kind of see what they're doing we'll get into this what what motivates some people um well real quick what motivates you at work what, what can be a motivator for you or motivating your employees incentives, incentives like what money, money. yeah <laughs> So, so our motivation is central is if you don't miss no days, your name goes in the hat to get a attendance. Yeah. Um, so there's there's that parking spots and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know. Hey, how's it going? Hey, uh, we pick Suey. Yes, sir. We pulled it out. Um, jump right in, and we'll catch you up on what you missed as far as the paper. It's not a big deal. So you can go along. Um, we're talking about motivation right now. What motivates you to do stuff? Now, they gave me some things, some incentives and stuff, and she said money, number one. So I, I took several classes um, in, in board behavior and business in my master's, and this was the overarching theme, and I agree with it, but it's going to take some explanation to get people to ever agree with this, and my wife still probably doesn't agree with this. Money is not a motivator. Okay. Now, I understand money, more money would motivate you probably to do stuff as an incentive in that form, maybe. Here's why you don't want it as a manager money to be a, mo a motivator, because you don't have enough of it, ever. It's a limited resource. You pay somebody $50,000 a year to do a job for you, and they're motivated because they left the job doing 25. Year, year and a half afterwards, are they as motivated as they were when they first started when they made the 25 to 50? Nah, they're probably like the rest of us, and they probably maxed out. 
$50,000 worth of income at this point, right? So you want to re-motivate them. So you give them, we doubled their salary before, let's double it. Let's give them a hundred. It's been a little facetious, but they take that. How long? They will never stop. So, so when they tell me money's not a motivator, I was, I was like, now, wait a minute. Money is an essential that you got to have. They don't work without getting paid typically. So as a manager, remember that when you're talking incentives and then you're talking salary and I've got some folks that I know they want to do a better job so that they can make more money. So that statement doesn't always seem to hold water, but I think what they were getting at in the, um, in my management and business side of it was you don't want that to be your motivator. Does that make sense? Makes sense. But when I don't open on Monday, when a client calls me and wants to come in on Monday, and then I look at your record and see you tip the same amount that you pay for your service, I am motivated to come in. Right, I exactly. If I look at your chart, and you are a non-tipper. You have to come in on the regular days. days yeah, yeah. But for me, that's why I'm like. I agree. I agree. I don't say I'm not following the statement. I'm just saying when we go into the. I understand why you say that because let's say. Like you're saying, the 50, 60, 70, you know, as you go. But you know, I think about it too. The more money you make, the more um, you acquire. Like, let's say, okay, if you went from the 25,000 spot, you know, you may have been driving a Pinto. And then you move up to the $50,000 spot, you may go buy you a Lexus. Well, that extra money that you would have, you know, could have, you didn't put it into a Lexus or you didn't bought you a bigger house, you didn't acquire more debt in some kind of way, most people. You know, I'm not saying that you no, will, but no, most no, people, no. most people do. So then that's what makes them unsatisfied at the end of the day. Like, hey, I got 50,000, but shoot, I'm still living like I got 25,000. Yeah. And then you, you know, they increase you to 100,000. Then you take it, then you got a lick, so now you got a jag. Cause they, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I can understand what he said. I understand it's what both of y'all are saying. More incentive for them, like, for like in, in our unit, they, no one would complete the SSDM. And then the first sergeant said, you complete it by this day, I'm gonna give you a full day off. If you complete it after them, I'm gonna give you a half a day off. Everybody got a full day off. Yeah, it's it full oh, life. Like, yeah, nobody here. So, so, right, so take take the motivation principle and what the definition was of what you want to do and think of this way. It is important and it does make you do more, but that's why you come to work anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So think of in those terms. It's really just what you really that's the why you're there. It's really not your motivator. Now, promotion is, and we'll get into that, why promotion, even though money should typically comes with that. Some places don't. Some places just retitle things and give people promotions really without any money. In fact, you'll see that, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, mid-level management, right? So if you're a, a foreman at a meal or a police officer, it's got 15, 20 years in, it's some police departments and stuff, you'll a lot of times make more money than the sergeant or the um, or the foreman or the supervisor that's just started. Why? Because you have been there longer and you've done that and you get that hourly rate and you get your overtime. And then when you go to salary, you may say, you, you know, you say, I want to move up into management. Well, you move to a $40,000 base salary, but you're no longer getting that overtime. Does that make sense? So sometimes promotions don't necessarily either, you know, but you want that promotion for a lot of other reasons, right? So that's where that, where really I think they're getting at is the motor, the money is the must. And then what you want to do, and I'm kind of jumping ahead, but you really want to get that equal balance of paying them what they're worth and then motivate them beyond that. Is that, you see where I'm getting at with that? That's a business principle. Uh, Cause if you're just, if you just say, I've got a lot of money and I'm going to hire a bunch of people, and I'm going to give them a whole bunch of things, a lot of money to do this job in about a year, year and a half, you're going to have to do that again and again. And you, then you lose your competitive advantage. Whereas you take say a Starbucks model who I don't know what they pay, but it's not like top dollar, but they give you even part-time employees. And so does UPS. We talked about this. I know what they were paying at the time I was there, but I, they still at the better than minimum wage, but not a real salary, but their incentives are for job security because of a union. Right. So if you want to work full time, you've got that part time you, and everybody gets good health care there, that kind of thing. They, and they got a retirement. They got a lot of good incentives that you had mentioned where money's not. So anyway, that's a, I just always hear that in every class. I said the exact same thing because I said the same thing sitting in my classes money. 
But and I see where their point is. It's not that money doesn't make you want to do things sometimes, but that's the that's the given, and then you work from there. And again, you want to hit a balance. Uh, like I said, pay them what employees need to be paid, what they're worth, and then the incentives get them motivated, right? And whatever else can be. So to break it down, you got outcomes and you got input, right? Anything a person gets from a job or an organization is an outcome. The kind of things like I mentioned. So what do you get from your job, right? Well, I get a check. And I get benefits, I get security. Me, lifelong government employee until I got two weeks left. <laughs> um, um, but my whole life, here's what it gave me. And, and I can think about it real heavy now. Security. Really, they weren't going to get rid of me for the last 20-something years. Could they? Yeah, because the Army's a little bit different. Height, weight, mm -hmm. they get you some physical disabilities and stuff. But pretty much things that I considered in my control, they really weren't bad about. I mean, I had security. Here's where the real security was. Because any job you can get fired from, any government job, it's not the government jobs don't fire you. The government typically doesn't go broke. They're broke, but they still pay you, right? They have that ability to print money. So the first and the 15th, I get a check. So just because the government goes a few trillion dollars in debt doesn't mean I don't get a check. If your company goes in debt, guess what? You could be losing money. You could take cuts shift changes, relocation, or job going all together. So for me, um, an outcome of, of my job has always been job security. I, I had a wife, we wanted to have a family, now we got kids, so it's been very comfortable knowing that I have that coming. So pay, job security, there it is. Benefits and vacation time. Uh, inputs is what a person contributes to his or her job organization. Time, effort, skills, knowledge, works, and behaviors. So I feel very proud of the last 26 years because in the military, that's one thing we kind of get um, get right. We do a lot of. We write down everything you do and give you awards and that. So I went back and, and you can look and see for the last 26 years the time, effort, skills, knowledge, and works and behaviors that I brought to the table. In fact, that helps me in my next career, at least on paper, one reason people want to hire you, right? Because I come from a place that values uh, some pretty good work behaviors and work ethics. You know, there's no really taken off for when the job's not done in my world, in my view. So they like that kind of view. So that helps you. So but those are what I put into the job. You put in certain things, you put in certain things, you bring things to the table. As a manager, realize that, that, and boy, do some managers forget sometimes, right? Some employers forget. They just see the outcome. Hey, you got a job. Yeah, but look what I'm bringing you to the table, you know? You're not paying me just because I'm me. You're paying me because of what I bring to the table. I used to hear that so many times in this particular job, and it was somewhat of a demotivator to the 1st and 15th that I looked at that check. But um, the reality, they say, well, you're just lucky to even be AGR and have a job here. You guys ought to get paid too much. And I always come up about a weekend after a drill, because one week in a month we would drill. But we didn't get compensated for that. We still worked 40-hour week plus that. There's zero compensation. You can look at it a hundred different ways. But that I was going, you're just lucky to have a job. Or you'd work straight through, mm -hmm. you know, AT. I went many years, probably a better part of 20, uh, working every single day in June. Because you had an annual training and a drill on top of that. So that's every single weekend. So we'd go about 40, 45 days in a row without a day off every year because of the previous one getting ready for her all the way through. It'd be July 4th before you was your first day off. Pay didn't change any, right? And then you look at the government paycheck from the Army, it's the 1st and the 15th, right? So in February, you get more money, right? It's 28-day month. Months have 31 days, you get three more days, and you get the exact same pay. Ever thought about that away? That's why other jobs don't pay on the 1st and the 15th. <laughs> they pay you by the time that you work. So I made more in February than I'd make, say, in January. That makes sense? So those are the things, though, you got to look at and see. So that's just some of the things that I've noticed over the years. And then when I started studying this, it, it really made sense, these principles of trying to get that balance right for folks. Because I've had many work for me that was going to go out to the civilian world and say, make all this money I'm like well you can think about it though and you have to throw in those things security first and the 15th checks like that those kind of things all right so here's the equation for it. got a lot of it but 
you have time, effort, education. These are inputs from your from the members that you have on your team. Uh, experience, skills, knowledge, and work behaviors. And then that moves over to their performance, which contributes to the organizational uh, efficiency, the effectiveness, and the attainment of the goals, right? So the more time and effort, education, experience, skills, and knowledge that this person has, is more performance they have, right? Should be, should be an equation there where that meets up, meets together. Then that equals your pay, your job security, your benefits, your vacation time, and all the way down. Oh, and feeling of accomplishment, the pleasure of doing interesting work, improving lives, well-being of others. That's a big one for me. For many years, you know, I felt like we had a purpose in the Army doing what we do. Um, uh, that was a big one. Uh, certainly didn't have any autonomy. <laughs> Lots of responsibility. Uh, those things. And that's every job. Uh, in some jobs you might have autonomy. Um, I think owning your own business you might to an extent, but I've never had that. Um, but... These things, this is the equation, and what they're getting at is what somebody worth to you, and as a company owner, business owner, or a manager, this is what you want to get right. All right? So many times, especially in middle management or at the government, we just fall into a pay chart, right? So, I mean, and here's the Army. It doesn't matter what, really matter what you do, job title. It's your rank in years that gets you your pay. There's some incentives. Doctors make a little bit more because of their being a doctor or something like that, but their base pay would run the same. So thinking in those terms is, you know, what should you pay someone? What should you be getting paid? And you start over on the left. And then, then how does that contribute to performance? And then that's your outcomes that you should be looking for, right? And, and that's just a, a way of seeing it so that we don't undervalue or, in some cases, rarely, do they overvalue their employees. Y'all heard that story about that one company, two brothers are fighting, they sued each other. One sued the guy because he was gonna pay everybody $50,000 a year. What? Yeah, he had a small tech company out west. It was 50 and it was 80. It was a large amount of money. Everybody across the board starting salary. They made a lot of money. They, they boomed, so he decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay everybody this amount of money and so he's on the good side of social media and his brother who's in the company with him and part owner is like no <laughs> we're not gonna pay everybody that and take our money and he looks like the bad guy because he's not wanting to uh, to uh, give up that money so i'll take the devil's advocate side and look at it this way might be that his brother's a good business manager he might be saying, it's not that I don't want them to have money and riches and that kind of thing. I want to continue to make money and they want to continue to stay in the job. Now, I don't know if they can afford the 80 or 100,000 or whatever it was forever, but he might be thinking that money's not a motivator. I don't want to go down that route because in two years, I'm having to do that again. No, remember, it was 80. Was it 80? Yeah. They were paying the janitor 80. the same amount. Yeah, everybody across the board is going to make the education and they yep. were upset mm -hmm. and they started quitting. Yeah, I think I'm gonna bring that to my next class. Next time we do this, y'all won't be benefit for that. That's gonna be one of our case studies to the book because the book's a low. That's a good one. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, I, the janitor, everybody across the board was gonna make, I'm gonna say, when I say everybody, this, this tech company, everybody, that's your base salary across the board. Sounds equal, sounds fair, some of that new wave, you know, hey, let's all be fair and stuff. And they were making millions and he's like, hey, I got more money than I can spend. And I applaud him for that. But then you got the other brother, which is probably like my brother. They're like, no, I got to run a business here, and we want to stay in business, and we got to be responsible. If that janitor wants a job in five years, he's probably not going to need to pay him eighty thousand dollars. Not knowing if he said that, I, I, I read it on social media. Eighty thousand dollars been cleaning the school. <laughs> but but, but with three times yeah, and that. she mentioned a good point. Think about, think about this though. I, I'm I'm the chief operation officer, right? Or I'm head of their security as far as their protocols and stuff on the computer, not the security guard guy. And I'm making 80. And I went to six years of college and got all this experience. And the next guy's making that. Normally, I don't worry what the other person makes. I don't try to judge myself based off someone else's self-worth, right? My self-worth and yours. I don't know how I see it. But would that be a little bit frustrating? Well, yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you something. I'm the type of person. I wouldn't give a darn. I don't care how hard I work. If the owner of the company saying he's gonna pay everybody eight thousand, as long as I got eight thousand, ninety thousand, as long as they pay me seventy five, 
Yeah. And they paid me but, 80. But think, I wouldn't, yeah. But think about I'm this way. I'm out of my own business. Think, Give it to me. Yeah, I got you. And that, that's a good I'll way. That's noble. But think about it this way. Just throw this out of the market. You're already, you're just making 80. The janitor was making 24. Right? Yeah. And your company, one of the reasons your company's making all these millions is because of your skill set. You're a key player in this. Okay. So he now he's going to give everybody a raise because they have more money. So he makes them equal across the board. I'm thinking his 80 should be, I mean, I'm for his raise, maybe 20. Yeah, make, make him get 60 and give me 100 because of what I bring. I could say that openly and fairly in front of the janitor because, you know, that, <laughs> Man, I ain't say nothing. <laughs> but you did, but you see what I'm getting yeah. at? I that. So oh. that becomes a real principle. So when I read that, I was thinking, man, this is a principles of management nightmare. You got one guy who is very innovative and creative and helped this company go. Then you got a brother who was at the 49% mark of owning the company, and that's where he was suing for. But he was, sound like the better of the business side. And you, you have a social responsibility and a company responsibility to keep things going for people, too, mm -hmm. to keep them employed. If money's truly not a motivator that you can sustain, let's at least put it that way, you're going to have issues. I mean, you're probably always keep a janitor at $80,000 a year. But I don't know how long you're going to keep people feeling like that the pleasure of doing interesting work or improving lives or a feeling of accomplishment when you're valued all the way across the same, right? That's a, that's a social experiment that we would call socialism, and it works in some places. For capitalism, which is still our base, don't care which way we fall and how you feel about it, either one of those two, we are a capital-based society. That's a tough one to get across for a business manager who has a responsibility to keep a business going. That's what I'm getting at. Does that make sense? So that's a real-life case that we have today that I find very interesting. They sued. I think the the brother won where he could pay everybody eighty thousand too. Uh, the brother, the one that wanted to pay everybody eighty thousand, yeah. was the one who won. Yes, because he had the he had the goods. I mean, he, I think he owned most of the company. So, so yeah, that and I was like glad. It. I was I glad. Think, yeah, I was glad as a, as a casual observer. Um, and I think the cost of living out there is high. So these other guys are really probably in their world getting undervalued. right? Because that's not a whole lot of money. But anyway, where they're at? Were they in Seattle somewhere? Hey, it was. California's. I don't know what that one is, but the other one is out of Texas. Well, it could have been Texas. Yeah. Oh. Everybody makes their salary, like whatever it is. But when they have their meetings, everybody comes. The secretary, the everybody, yeah, everybody comes. And they everybody gets input, you know, so they don't put you to the side no matter where you are in the company. And it's a private company, so they don't have stocks and all that stuff. Right. That's it. If we make this one, I'm gonna give everybody a um, brand new car. The car was like a forty thousand dollar car. You can take the fifty thousand cash. They reached that mark, and then they put another goal out, and they met it. And then that's when it hit the news and the TV. Everyone in the company got a hundred thousand dollar bonus. Wow! And when I said it was flooded with resumes, and mm -hmm. people, I'm like, people don't leave those jobs. No. They don't just quit and get mad. Mm -hmm. at. You don't leave, but but the secretary still makes. Like her regular salary, forty thousand or whatever mm -hmm. she makes, and then the other people make, but they everyone got a straight out hundred thousand dollars check. So yeah, it, that one a little different, but very good yeah. point. Yeah, so you could almost see that one somewhat working. That's why I, I think mm -hmm. socially, I like the other one where the brother had most of the stock in the company or the ownership. However, mm -hmm. they broke it up. I don't know if they're private or not, but apparently they weren't because they had to go to. The, they were able to go to court because just people owned it, they wouldn't have to go to court. But well, two of them, I guess they would. But I wanted to see it that one brother win where everybody gets 80% just so that I can see how I'm going to keep trying to keep up with this to see how that comes out. Right. Same way with this other company. Is that a business model out there that works? Jesse Ventura, the governor of Minnesota at one time, the wrestler guy. Right. I saw a thing with him, not a supporter or against him anyway, but I saw a thing. It was during the minimum wage raise to $15 an hour. He said, we need a maximum wage, right? Uh, that's not capitalism whatsoever. But his point was much to what you were talking about. He said, every single Walton is worth a billion dollars. And they are. They have this much money. So they should be capped at what they make. And then profit sharing should go down to the others. So he was kind of saying the same thing. Now that I think about what you said, it's not a... a um, 
where you have to get fifteen dollars to come to work, right? An hour here versus the ten, twelve, whatever they pay. It's since the company made this much money, that should go back to the employees, at least a portion of it. Where because it's so lopsided right now, right, in our world. And that's the other side, the flip side of capitalism is it spins out of control sometimes or it gets so big of a gap, right? Um, because you got billionaires and you got people, you know. And then, of course, the government really can't fix it because if you did raise minimum wage, and I'm not saying that raising minimum wage is a bad idea, I can just tell you what Walmart would do or McDonald's or anybody else. Who would pay for that? The customer. They would just up the price of everything. I mean, the, the simple fix is just raise it. You'd have to do something different to see where that money would come back. And I think that's what Jesse was getting after is is we know that that model we've done that before every time we raise stuff and prices go up they just pass that back to the consumer the company still makes a lot of money an example of that gap they're talking about military pay so in the 80s they started giving raises and then or the 90s whenever it was to the military and they went on percentages an officer makes this much enlisted makes this much and they kind of marry up, but the officer doing basically the same responsibility wise, years, what thing, whatever, is going to be a tad bit more because of what they do. So, but they started, they were close, but they started getting percentage raises, right? And about the 90s, they realized because of the percentage raise, the officer was making almost twice what an enlisted person was. It was never intended to be that way, but they just did a straight percentage raise. Right, so they had to go back and fix that. So they gave these 17 to 20 percent raises to E6s and E7s in the mid 90s, and where the officers got like a one percent that way they could catch back up, it would be near the gap between the two. And that's kind of where you're at with some of these businesses on the looking at that model. So that's why you have some businesses that makes a billion dollars, several billion dollars a year, but their employees nobody makes right. And they have managers that do, but like two thirds. 89% of their employees are at the $12 an hour rate. Mm -hmm. So that's what that gets into. So that, but that's where it comes from. But, but those companies argue back time, effort, right? We got that education, experience, skills, knowledge. That's where they really come back and argue. Why do I have to pay someone without education, experience, skills, or knowledge this much money to do that? And we've just talked about two companies that said, I don't care. I'm going to give them this amount of money. So and it seems so far work for them. Don't know. About track and know where that makes sense and why these things matter as a manager. In our world, we might not fix it, but understand that. So when you're talking about fairness, equity, and dealing with employees, understand from where they're coming from, and we do management, understand where they're coming from. You know. So and here we are, expectancy theory: the theory that motivation will be high, and workers believe that that um, high levels of effort lead to high performance, and high performance leads to Tame and desired outcome. That's Victor Vroom, and I like that name. Victor Vroom, 1960s, to be a race car driver. Uh, is this theory correct in your mind? I mean, is that all it is to it? What's your question again now? Do you, is that how that works? I mean, the motivation will be high when workers believe the high levels of effort lead to high performance. You mentioned I, the first sergeant or says you get off for drill because you do this. I mean, that's that's that right there. Mm -hmm. Tit for tat, mm -hmm. right? If, if we're all elite, now nah, I've been to a lot of those drills. Clean up, get everything done, we go home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you clean everything up, and then you, you're leaning against the wall, right? And it's happened probably in a lot of organizations. That's why I say the expectancy theory is a good theory, and sometimes it works if you get the right motivation, the right people, the right thing that you're talking about, right? So it's a good theory. It's not invalid, but in my opinion, it's not a rule. That's why it still says theory. It's not a business principle, right? Out there that that if, if if you can just convince your workers that if they do work hard then we'll get what we're supposed to get and everybody will be happy because we all know we've worked really hard in businesses before and those businesses did not succeed right 
not just because you did your part and someone else didn't. I mean, some businesses for unforeseen reasons has failed, right? Some companies have not made it and everybody worked hard, so it doesn't. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. Right. Yeah, you have those innocent eyes and stuff. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's a good point. It's, it's kids, what we think. So, expectancy, instrumentality, and balance. This just breaks it down a little bit more. So your effort, is, and is, effort is definitely an important input, right? Because sometimes you hire people because of their knowledge and stuff, but without effort, guess what? Ain't going to do you much good. So a person's expectancy, a person's, bless you, is a person's perception about, to, about the extent to which his or her effort will result in a certain level of performance. So they think, and I think, you all can relatively believe this, and know this, if you work a certain amount, you should get this, right? We also know, though, that there's a point of diminishing returns or it don't always work. I always use the uh, football example. I can work really, 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 really hard at being a good football player, but you know, I would never make it right. There's a, there's a cap for a 43-year-old guy that's, that's you know, 5'9", <laughs> 180-something pounds. I mean, it's just there's only so much you can do. I could get in a lot better shape, but I'm not ever going to be able to – is that but there's there's a reasonable amount that you understand that you can achieve and obtain i can become better at things right then that effort leads like we mentioned to performance then instrumentality is a person's perception about to extent which the performance at a certain level will result in attainment of outcomes right so i can't really expect certain outcomes just because i work hard but there's certain ones i can then the violence is how desirable each of the outcomes available from a job or organization is to a person so that's me looking at jobs in the last year or so, right? I hit to the balance point. I know if I work a certain amount, right, uh, give enough effort, which leads to my performance, which would give me enough outcomes, I could do that job, right? That was my first look. When I go through looking through, looking for jobs, can I do that job? HR manager job came open, my mail. Read the qualifications for it. I have a higher degree than they call for. I have the right degree. I have a level of experience. So I go, if I work enough, I can do the job. I have, I get the right outcomes. But then I got over to the balance side. Being a human resources professional, which is nothing wrong with that. And a job going off, I was just me thinking in my mind before I even applied for it, right? And I said, you know, how desirable is the outcomes available for organizations to a person? What would be the outcome of that job? Salary? 40 hours a week, and then it stopped for me. Nothing in there sounded desirable to the thing that I wanted to do. So that balance for me was there. Does that make sense where this comes from, seeing it? So this can work currently in the job that you have, jobs that you're thinking about, and or in the employees that you have when you talk to them. This is a good counseling format. So if you're talking to someone that's working for you and you want to counsel them and motivate them, this is it right here, right? So you talk to them about their effort and what they expect for their effort. Their effort turns into a certain amount of performance and their perception of what outcomes that we're trying to get, right? So you say, listen, you're working this hard right now and that should be yielding these results, which is to our outcomes. Now, if it's not, then that's the first part of the counseling you talk about. You're doing this much effort and it's not enough or you're doing this much, but it's the wrong effort. And you get here at four every morning, we don't open to six. <laughs> you know, it's not doing us any good. That extra two hours, because we're not even here. You know, you're waiting in the parking lot. Rudimentary example, but you see what I'm saying? That makes a counseling one. And then the real crux of the counseling and talking to people to motivate them, which should be the real reason of counseling, not for trouble. They got a trouble thing, which we tend to go to, is that balance. What is it that you desire and you want right and i've ran into people who really and this really set me straight and i got less frustrated with them their desire wasn't what i would seem to think it would be they really didn't want to move up that's why certain jobs just pay more for time they really didn't see themselves wanting to do that extra or i say extra taking down the other responsibility or even doing it they, they were really proud and happy where they were at 
frustrating for a manager when someone doesn't want to move up sometimes, right? That, oh, you're a good employee. However, you're, if you work a little harder or stay a little extra, you could get to this, and they never do. And you're like, mm. well, I'll give you a prime example. Uh, I won't call her name because she works out here, but best employee I, one of my best employees ever. She's E5, but her husband has a really good job. She's got a good job here at AGR, and she does a really good job at it. E6 jobs come up at all over the state. She will not remove for the promotion because she has to move her family, her husband's here, whole thing. She's got good insurance. She likes what she's doing. She's good money, and she's here, but she's here 40 hours a week. That extra level, and at first, and I've had the privilege of working with her three or four times in my career. First couple times in my younger days, I would be that way. I would be like, you're kind of frustrated. You're good. You're talented. If you just do a little more, because, you know, we're working some more hours and stuff. No, sir, I'm not going to do that. She didn't bother explaining to me that she was set and everything else. Not her fault. It would be my fault. Get to counseling her and look at this and go through this thing. And I realized, hey, her husband has got this. She's got this. They're very comfortable. She would have to give up a lot to move. She had to give up a lot for this. And it's not that she's lazy or doesn't want responsibility. It was none of that that I was putting in my mind. Counseling worked both ways. It helped me to understand that balance for her was job security, very good insurance because he worked on a contract company. He does, like a lot of overseas work. They pay really good, but it's on and off. And insurance is great to have steady all the way through when you got two kids, that kind of thing. So her violence was that, supporting her family to the best of her ability, without a way. When I realized that, man, we got along famously and was able to utilize her as a very good employee versus in the past getting frustrated. So you can do it. And same thing, me looking at jobs when I was looking through. Does that make sense, everybody? What we're getting at here through effort, performance, and outcomes, and then where your expectations and instrumentality and balance comes in. Okay. You ever heard of this chart, seen this chart? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's that's where the guy says, you know, you got certain needs you got to meet, and then you meet the next ones. When you meet that, you move to the next one. It's a pyramid that goes up. I don't know how the book they put it in the pyramid form, but here it is. So the lowest level need for someone is the most basic or compelling. Uh, oh, I like the bottom sense too. The lowest level of unsatisfied needs motivates behavior. Once this level of needs is satisfied, a person tries to satisfy the needs at the next level. So it's stair step, right? We'll get into a better theory in my mind in a minute. It's valid, but we'll get into a little better way of seeing things. Uh, but this is still taught like as the rule all the time. Uh, the lowest level needs most basic, basic is physiological needs such as food, water, shelter must be met, right? You do that as a company by providing a level of pay that enables a person to buy food and clothing and have adequate housing. That's where it's not a motivator at. Then safety needs is next. And it's the same thing. You take the caveman, the first thing they try to do is find food and stuff, right? The next you look for safety, security, stability by providing job security, adequate medical benefits and safe working conditions. Next, belongingness needs, which is needs for social interaction, friendship, affection, and love. You see that working this way up, you know, you now I've got my family taken care of, I got me taken care of, got my shelter, right? Now I'm relatively safe, you know, I've got an organization that's safe, and now what I want to do is go meet people and talk to people and feel like I'm involved, okay? So you do that by promoting good interpersonal relations and organizing funk social functions such as company picnics and holiday parties. So you work for companies where they just hit the basic needs and they don't care about any of that, right? And that's typically those jobs that we enter into uh, high school or during high school, and they pay those minimum wages, right? There's not much there for you. That would be, you know, that minimum wage job working in the service industry somewhere at the cash register. Or uh, me, I was pushing cards for Walmart when I was in high school. And then, then, then you look for a job that has security, stability, and safe insurance, and that kind of things, right? That's when you move into getting that first real job, as you call it. It's going to take care of those. And then you work to your third one, which is you try to either work up in that particular company or find a job where you can find that. And then esteem needs is met next, which is needs to feel good about oneself and capabilities to be respected by others. So basically, this is where you want your title at. And the job means something, right? If you, if you have the right title on a job or it means something to people, it's not just about title, but you know it means something, 
And you do this by granting promotions and recognitions and accomplishments, right? This is what the military is really good at doing. We're really good at handing out trinkets to you that really don't cost much money that people work real hard for. In the military, we hand out coins as motivation. We hand out awards. You know what an award cost? I mean, it takes a lot to get an award, but it's actually about $3.50. That's with the little green folder and the little metal they hang on you and everything. I mean, it ain't much. Now, we pay like $11.50, $12 for one or something like that. We're just getting ripped off, but really it's about $3.50. And then what are they worth? Intrinsic value? Absolutely nothing. Like a silver star doesn't really have silver in it. It's like one of those pieces, I mean, nine ounces of silver in it. And that's like, would be amazing to get. So you do it based on esteem, right? Before that, we have belonging, right? And then you, then you start working on esteem. So see where it's working up to? I got my social friends now. Now I want to, uh, that's my belonging to people. Now, amongst the people that I know, I want to have some self-esteem with that. And they know me as this person, right, who does this. They know, you know people say this, they know that I'm not that kind of person. I'm a person that works hard or I care. You've, you know, this is where you're working towards. And then he says, as low everybody tries to get to self-actualization needs, the needs to realize one's full potential as a human being. This is by giving the, this is like the Zen moment. I'm there. I don't really need all of y'all. I got all this other stuff. By giving people the opportunity to use their skills and abilities to the full extent of possible. By granting, uh, yeah, there. So basically, this is where you want your employees if you put it in the small way. Right, they're working not because they're motivated by anything else except for they know that's what they're supposed to be doing. I've, I've realized that I am a janitor and what I'm going to do is be the best janitor there is. Whether you pay me the 80,000, like you just gave me boss, or the 20,000, doesn't really matter. This is my calling in life. It has purpose. That's self-actualization, right? So you work your way up his, his um, I always see it except for this book in a pyramid, you know, down here and you work your way up. So everybody understand. So anybody see any issues with this at all? Makes sense? It's a good way of breaking it down. And I believed it for a long time. I still believe it. It's still it's still valid. But we'll go to the next one. This guy. Audifer. So he's saying as lower level needs are satisfied, a person is motivated to satisfy higher needs. When a person is able to satisfy, satisfy higher needs or is frustrated, motivation to satisfy lower needs increases. Okay? So he sees it a little more dynamic. You don't just complete one and move to the next. You complete one, you move up there, and it doesn't get what you need or you don't succeed at it, then you go back, you have a stronger desire to do the one below you more. Does that make sense? So uh, existing needs is basic food. Well, same thing across there. Uh, bottom line is what he's saying again is, is real simple, is the adverse of Maslow, when you don't reach that next level, it just motivates you more for that level that you just completed to do better at it. Right? So if you don't have, if you're not relating to people, and you work really hard on just your basic needs. And if you don't have your growth needs met, then you work really hard on your, uh, to relate to people. We can see that between steps two and three up there. Or, yeah. So you ever see people work really, really, really hard just to get along or be liked? This theory would suggest that they have not met their growth needs and it just and they either failed or just didn't achieve that. So it pushes you back down to really working on, I'm going to be really, really good at just people liking me. Right, this whole book's about that. Right. People like how to be liked by others without hitting that self-actualization part of it. Then, um, wait a minute, let me see if this guy it does. Okay, before we get off on those, my theory on this is it's not necessarily. A, um, and this is not Stephen Hall's theory, this is what I learned. So those are good to know, they're good principles. So you'll know when you're relating to an employee, counseling, talking to them, and they're having issues or you're just trying to get the best performance out of them. You want to know where they sit on that triangle or that the pyramid rather, which is 
are they just looking for food, water, shelter? Are they looking for insurance? Right. Is that really, are they looking for security needs? Are they looking for social needs or self-actualization? Actualization. When you figure that out, then you can best serve what they need. And you're not offering a good benefit package to someone and they're looking at you like you're crazy when they're only really worried about the next check, which happens sometimes. Everybody, you know what I'm saying? So it'll kind of let you know where you're at. Here's my theory, not mine, but the theory that I subscribe to is that's valid and you need to know this so that when you're, just like I talked about, when you're counseling someone, you understand where they're at and what their next need is. And also know when they're overcompensating, that might be because they failed at this particular one. But remember this, at any given time, you can jump the scale. You don't have to complete one to go to the next. I'll give you an example. I've hit my Zen moment. I realize now that for 27 years in the military that I've had good service and I don't have to make anything else. I've got a good retirement coming. Money doesn't mean that much to me. I'm taken care of. I know all this. And I feel really, really good about myself. I'm at the top of that pyramid. After the class is over, I'll say bye. I'll walk out there and a guy jumps up and puts a gun in my face, right? I don't go back down to how to relate to me, that, that one right below it. I go back down to that very first level, <laughs> right? right? Or the, the safety one, at least. I can jump back down. Or I walk out of here and they tell me, well, sorry, but we no longer have a retirement for you. Your retirement is null and void. You don't have that. And your medical is canceled. I go all the way back to the bottom of that pyramid now. I'm just looking for a way before the first of next month hits to stay in that house that I'm living in, right? Mm -hmm. I'm back now. So now I'm like, honey, we can't even talk about dreams and getting a pool or, or going on vacation. That's out the window. I got to find a job. I'm back to step one. And so it can, the, that's what I subscribe to is it, just remember, you just because you're at one doesn't mean you just got to, and you worked really hard to get there, but you can't go right back to the other. Or very quickly jump to the top one. I don't have any examples for that one, but you can, I would imagine. That's the theory that I read. Does that make sense, everybody? So so you can go up and down. But the reason we want to know this as a manager again is to see where someone sits down there so you know what they're trying to go to next. I don't know if anybody in here hunts, but if you hunt a deer, that's really what you're trying to do. You want to intersect them before they get to the water or the food or the girlfriend. That's really all you're doing. It's the same thing, and it's not a, a bad technique or disingenuous. I mean, I tell people up front, I want to know where you're going as an employee so that I can be on the same sheet with you, right? And I'm not counterproductive at a minimum to you, but hopefully I can help you get there. So if you understand where they're at on that pyramid, then you should be able to understand, which gets you to the motivator needs. Um, it relates to the nature of the work itself, autonomy, responsibility, and interesting work. Hopefully, this is where you can be at as a manager. Right, because a lot of times you can't control salaries and insurance and benefit packages and stuff. It's a lot of those are tied in with corporate. Maybe you can, but you want to be hopefully at where the work that they're doing, you can give them autonomy because they're good at it and they understand what they're doing. And you give them responsibility and they're very interested in it. Right? We all seen the people that just really don't like their job. You know? mm -hmm. My biggest fear looking for another job was that. I just want to say we got to that balance. Am I going to like this next thing? Now, I was able to do that because where I sat at that particular point on the um, pyramid of things, I have a retirement. I still have insurance. So I can be way different than I would be if you took those away from me. Hygiene needs are related to the physical and Physiological context of the work, comfortable work environment, pay and job security, right? So we definitely need that. We always see it was that dangerous jobs out there, or ice road truckers and those different things out there. Those make good shows, but you want to uh, understand uh, that you've got to at least meet these needs. Comfortable work environment, comfortable pay, and job security out there, right? Need for achievement. The extent to which an individual has a strong desire to perform challenging tasks well and to meet personal standards for excellence. Some people are driven this way, right? I know some guys I work with, man, this is them. They have a need for achievement. I lack in this area a lot of times. <laughs> I kind of pass that one up. I don't have a huge need. I mean, I'm just not a competitive person. I don't have a need to achieve a certain amount of things. Uh, good sometimes, 
sometimes it's not. Um, neither one's bad, but some people are motivated for this way. Does that make sense? If you can understand yourself, that was the quiz thing we were taking before the assignment. If you can understand others, then you can better again not get in their way and hopefully enhance them and not get in your own way. Equity theory. I got a buddy. This is him. A theory of motivation that focuses on people's perceptions of their fairness of the work outcomes relative to the work inputs. So you mentioned and I'm, I follow along the line your lines, right? When the employee got 80,000, I'm fine with that. <laughs> you know, I like to see you get yours. I got a buddy. He would, this social experiment, this company's doing would drive him crazy. He would be that guy. He'd be that guy if he was a janitor, even though he'd probably take the 80,000. He'd be the guy worried about it. It would drive him insane that he's not doing enough for it. I mean, he's just that kind of guy. You've been to that place. You, everybody's probably got that friend. You know, you go to split up the meal. You say, it's just split it four ways. And he's, you know, I didn't eat all those chips. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't eat the appetizer, right? So we'll take a dollar off years now, right? And then I, this is me. So I say, I say, hey man, I, we'll take, you know, we'll take a dollar off of years. Then he tries to put the extra thirty something cents on everybody. Just too much math for me. I say, I'll just pay the dollar. Oh, oh, you're just rich, huh? No, you make more than me. I just don't care. It's a dollar, you know. But it's equity to him. He he. I used to think, man, why is he? You know, he's really. What it is, is he wants it to be fair across the board. I mean, it just really means a lot for him that everybody pays the same. Me, I don't I don't care. So it drives him crazy because if he gets ripped off, it's not that he's that tight that he's getting ripped off. He still would get mad that, well, why was she, should you have, he said this, why should you have to pay the dollar? I don't have to. It's just, if it's going to, if we got to talk another minute about it, I'm going to pay the whole bill. <laughs> I'm ready to go. That's, so you got to have those kind of friends, right? Everybody has it. You might be that person. Nothing wrong with that, right? Probably be good. It's probably why I don't own my own business because I would probably lose everything, you know, because I'm like, well, whatever. But that, you know, me and him get along. We've been friends for nearly 40 years now, but this is him to the T. Operant conditioning theory. It's uh, people learn to perform behaviors that lead to desired consequences and learn not to perform behaviors that lead to undesired consequences. I call this the sergeant major theory. I call this the yell at you theory, right? It's basically you are, or Pavlo, the dog gets responded to, you know, from eating. Uh, it's, it's there. It works to a certain extent. I try not to ever operate this away if I can. I work in an environment I don't have to. Uh, but it's good. I mean, you want to learn behaviors that lead to desired consequences, right? You mentioned earlier, it's like how, how you teach your children. You know, you're going to have to brush your teeth, you're going to have to comb your hair, you have to put the odor on, son, because if you don't, by tomorrow, they're going to make fun of you, right? It's not good, but I, I can break it down to your level. I, there's a hundred reasons why I want you to do all that, but I can break it down to this. I'll save you some pain in middle school, right? If you don't have stinky breath, you don't stink and your hair's gone. It'll save you some of that middle school pain. Middle school is awful. Um, People uh, learn that, and, and then they continue to do the uh, and get rid of the behaviors that you know give you undesired consequences, right? So that's operant conditioning. As a manager, you can use that, right? But you hope to work in an environment where people are motivated to do the right thing. Whole idea of this chapter. Um. So, anyone underpaid here? Anyone overpaid? So I got a buddy that used to work here as a civilian and they just didn't understand him. They loved him. He did a great job. Everybody loves this guy. This guy did live on my couch for about a year because of this work thing that he had going. Had a good job out here. Made good money. But they kept wanting to promote him and put him into this other position to run everything. He did not want that. I used to think there's no one that could ever really be overpaid. This is that individual. He turned down the promotion, turned down the promotion. They got frustrated with him. Finally, they gave him a job and responsibility. And what did he do? Quit. He had met his needs at this bottom two 
of the triangle, and he didn't need. He met the other two already. That's why I like don't like the Mas Maslow is is their stair stack. Well, before this guy ever had to get a full time job out here, he had already been belonging to groups, and he basically had self actualized who he was and what he was going to do in life, which was, for him was never going to be amount to this huge success in his mind. That's not what the average world would see as success if we were to do it by buildings and money and things that you own, right? In his mind, that just you know, he'd be like a hippie. It just didn't matter to him. He had hit those two. Now, I've known this guy my whole life. My father raised him with us, so he's like a brother to me. I mean, he literally lived with me longer until just maybe a year ago than my wife had lived with me to this point because we grew up together in my house. But this is the way he was. We always knew this is the way he was. Great worker, great attitude, smart guy. But when they got him overpaid, and he didn't just he didn't just say you gave me too much money and I quit. It was one of those they, he was being forced into it. He was unhappy for several months. They were unhappy with him, you know. And then he up and quit. And they're like, why? They couldn't. We should understand the military organization. We're just beating our head to want that next promotion, next promotion. He's working for people in the military, even though it's a civilian. They overpaid him. They couldn't me say, what happened to this guy? You overpaid him. Should have left him where he's at. He'd still be here doing that same job. They could not understand that. So there's actually some folks. Um, I'm not overpaid in my mind. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm okay in that route. But that, you know, I don't know if y'all know anybody like that, but I've, I've met that one out there. Man, it's good dude. Oh, and by the way, Working now, again, found him a job. Like I said, he's self-actualized. He's belongs to people. Works way more for less money than he worked out here. Pretty dang happy. <laughs> it's the craziest thing. All right, so steps in the, uh, modifying behavior. So if you got a team or an employee and you want to modify their behavior, this is the rudimentary book way of doing it. Number one, identify an important behavior. All right, so here's the example. Assemble computer printers. Number two, managers measure the frequency at which the behavior is occurring. So each worker, so you just observe and say, well, each worker is uh, assembling on average 10 per day. Then you determine if people know whether they should be performing the behavior and what consequences they receive when they perform it. So workers know that they should assemble as many printers as they can per day. Sounds simple, but what if they think they don't have, you know, you got to make sure they understand it just because you did 10 doesn't mean you can't do 12, right? So you explain to them. And after that, uh, they rightly point back out to you, they're making the same money anyway, right? That was my UPS, that was my UPS lesson. They yelled at me and wanted me to unload as many trucks as I could in that four hour period. So I met the guy that I mentioned that was working under the union just so he could get the um, benefits because he's a horse trainer. And I got in his truck and I started slinging boxes and he said, slow down, son. We're not going to finish this truck during this shift, except for right at the end of it. I'm like, what? We got to get on the truck. And he goes, yeah, they can't fire us. He, he said, we get paid the same. In fact, you get paid less if you, if you finish because a few nights, on our four or five hour shift, we finish all those trucks. Go home. Go home. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? That was less money. I just worked harder for less. Mm -hmm. He explained this to my young self. Guy had some wisdom in him. I was like, wow. Now, company's got a union. That's the only reason that could happen. They had fired us early on. Kind of the same thing. You got to understand. So, so now as a manager, you realize that, okay, y'all can do more, but I'm paying you the same regardless. So then you develop an implied strategy entailing the use of positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement or punishment or extinction, right? And you say, well, if I catch you loafing, I'm going to fire you, or you can say I can give you more. So you say, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to positively reinforce each worker that they receive $5 for each defect-free printer they assemble instead of an hourly wage. So now you're off your hourly wage, and you're going to get the 5 bucks for everyone to do right. Now, if UPS said, hey, the more trucks you unload, the more you get. So if you unload one, you get $20, right? If you unload these other four, because I was doing four a night. Right. I was young and shaking. They took advantage of me. I didn't know any better. And I was 
did what I was told. I ran this other guy. And he's like, you gotta slow down. And I'm like, what? And there was people outperforming me. I was like, this is crazy. So they weren't, they weren't there. They have reasons why they weren't. And they're still a good company. But you realize this, you take them off for $5, right? You say, I'm going to take you off hourly wage and give five for each one. Then you measure it, right? You have to have a way to measure it. And then the example of that is they are now doing an average 14, 14 per day. Well, if that if that's good and you can afford the five dollars at fourteen per day, you gotta be careful what if I can't afford that. What if that comes up for more of their hourly wage? Ideally, what you want is that to come out equal to their hourly wage, right? <laughs> Not less, because you might be making a little bit more money, but then they feel like they're getting cheated and they'll go back. Not a whole lot more because you just cost you more money to get one, right? There's a point of diminished returns at this point. So you have to measure that and think about that as a manager, right? And if the answer is no, then you go back and repeat steps two and three. Re Reevaluate, how do I get them to do this? Maybe I need to use negative, maybe I need to use positive. And then, or the problem solved. Does that make sense? That's how they tell you in the book. There's your steps. Anybody got any issues with that? It's, it's a logical way of looking at it. But there's a lot more, like I said, that comes into play. Like I said, what if, what if I'm at $5 and, 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 and the guy's doing – you know, 30 of them. Wow. And then what if there's only 50 for the shift to be had? And you got six workers, right? So everybody else is not making as much money. Production can hurt you that way, right? So one guy's eating up most of the money, but he can't possibly do 60. And you need 60 done. He can only do 30. But because he's getting five dollars more, he's getting more than everybody else. But now the people, because they're not as fast, they're not making as much money now, so they quit and go somewhere else, but you can't rely on the one guy. Does that all make sense? All those factors have to come in place, so that's why I say it's a very rudimentary example. But those are things as a manager, this is the level of depth and things to think about when you do that. You probably do this all the time in your business world, right? You're like, ah. Yeah. Huh? Let them decide. Right. You do, what I do, it's 90 days. You can pay me like a certain amount per client. You can pick the base rental and just take that. So if you make over, like you bring in more clients, and then it'll offset like the monthly rent, then they have switch to that. But you can only switch in a quarter. Right, and you can't yeah. be so jerking you back. If you start making more money, then that's more money for me because you chose to. But when you're 90 days, you can switch to the regular rate. You just have to be careful because when, like, December comes, right, goes yeah, down. goes down, goes right. And in August, it goes down. So if you're a hustler and you're smart and you know what you're yeah. doing and you're getting after it, and that's kind of kind of here they could have done. They could have said easily to, it's just very rudimentary. They could have said, we're going to put, you know, 10 on you a day you got to do. And then we're going to give you a bonus for each mm -hmm. one up to a certain extent because there's a certain amount that, you know, that could break you, either break you or hurt your other employees. And, and that's kind of where you're at. You know, you're going to kind of pick your own deal, which – Choice, I commend you for that because all studies show when people have choices, they're happier. Mm -hmm. Even if they make the wrong one, it's, it's they're happier because they had that choice. They'll, they'll find a reason to justify it. I've done it with cars. I rode off a lot with a car that I did not need and really didn't want, shouldn't have bought. And I justified why I needed that car. Now I go back and look at it now and you know, years later and go, that was a bad decision, but I justified it. I knew then it was a bad decision. I could justify it. I had a choice though. Car dealerships gave me a choice, and that's what they like to do. I'd uh, buy them, used to, I'd buy the more expensive option. Nowadays, because I'm at this age and stuff, I don't, I go, we go cheap. But, but you know, but I, I guarantee you, uh, I drove off the lot with those choices, even though it was me that chose probably the less financially desirable one. I, I gave them 50 reasons to her parents, my parents, and all my friends why well, that was a good idea. Because we got to haul all the ambassador kids around. That's why I need that big vehicle. <laughs> so that's the thing to think about. Employee stock option, financial instrument that entitles the bearer to buy shares or organization stock at a certain price during a certain period of time. Just another way of, um, and, and, you know, motivating employees. That's it for this chapter. What are your questions? Anything? We need a quick break. All right, let's take a quick, quick uh, five-minute break. I'll pull up the next slides, and we'll get into Chapter 14, which is leadership. 
Oh, that's Man, I had wow. to take some allergy medicine. Boy, it is. I can feel it. I've been getting allergy shots here lately. I don't know if they work. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that allergy medicine, boy, man. Boy, I hate taking it. Also, my allergy so flared up the other day. Still in my system, making it so. We hit resume here, recording. All right, we're going to go over leadership. Again, for all the students. Also, they're listening. I'm teaching that next, not next block, but the next block, right? I'll switch over to it. Uh, so um, I want to do a class joint joint for that. Oh, and before I forget, I should put this up at the very front. Um, the survey is open now. You can do the survey of the class. So please fill out the survey. All students, please fill out the survey. <clears throat> Last class of three or four of them filled it out. So, and they're like, hey, Stephen, you, everybody said good things, but none of the people said anything. <laughs> so <clears throat> fill it out. Um, fill out whatever you feel. Um, I'll take all the I need all of the feedback, and then they're happy um, at CBC when they see we have max participation. So fill out the survey. All right, leadership. So what's leadership? That's the book definition. What do y'all think it is? I like that. That's good. See. That would go along the lines of that's definitely leadership, but I call that servant leadership. Um, that's what I aspire as a leader to be as a servant leader. But yeah, help people achieve their goals. That's where my self actualization comes at, or my sense of purpose is. I, I love to. Hit. That's what I like to do is help people achieve their goals and stuff. Um, so, but the book's got it as the process by which a person exerts influence over others and inspires, motivates, and directs. The activities to achieve group organizational goals. So I'm gonna ask this question and then I'll tell you why I'm asking. Is humility important to be a leader? To be humble? Mm -hmm. See, I thought so because in every class I've ever had, and I can show you where all the writings are about it, but I thought I'm gonna ask people this. I've asked a lot of people this and everybody said yes. So why do y'all think yes? Why do y'all say yes? When you don't have it. It's, it, it creates, to me, a hostile work environment, and it deteriorates the camaraderie in the workplace. Mm -hmm. I aspire to, because at one time I probably wasn't near humble enough. Uh, again, my, my traits that I aspire to have, I think, you know, uh, you can do that through a heart change, not a not behavior modification, but uh, which most of what these books and or behavior talks about, but I, I'm a heart change guy. I aspire that to be that. So my wife is um, working, and her boss tells her that, and her boss is new. So one of the professors is now the head of the whole department. Now she's always been a mentor of my wife's, and worked her way up. My wife recently received her doctorate and getting tenure there at UCA. Her boss says, you know, you're just a little too quiet. Now, my wife is not, she's quiet and kind and quiet. But, I mean, she's like any mom. She's not going to be ran over by me or anybody. I'm like, man, you're completely misreading her because she's not going to, you know, she has, and she leads in a lot of ways. And I see it, and that's my wife, so I see that. But she told her, and it just drives me crazy, she told her that humility is not a leadership quality. She told your wife that? She told her that. She's told her four or five times now. She just wrote it down in counseling. Humility. And it's not anything bad. She's just saying, you need to be more outspoken. I'm thinking, no, you probably need to be quieter. <laughs> but but uh, that's just me thinking. I mean, I'm sure she's, and they all like her. She's a good boss. But I'm thinking, man, where did where did we go wrong with this one? Where did she, but anyway. So I was just curious in the last several months when that was coming about. That, that humility is not a leadership trait. We'll get into that in the leadership class. But um, good. I'm not I'm not in the minority on that one anymore. I thought maybe that's a new thing or something I'm missing out there. But I, I still find it to be very important. And, of course, I would like to say something to it because sometimes I'm not humble enough. My wife's like, no. And it's not. It's not my business. And they're actually good friends and get along fine. But it, but it was just one of those things that sticks in my head that well, well, a leader would say that. <laughs> right, right. Just give a little bit of pain advice as a leader. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, don't, don't. That's one thing I love about her is, you know, she's she's a, a a great mom and 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 got a great career and got a doctorate and doing great things, and you see her and, and you, that's not a thing to her, you know. She doesn't. It's not titles and that she's humble, but that's not a bad thing. That's why people work like her and that's why she does good and their students yeah. like her. But and that's what keeps everybody. Keep it, it keeps you. It keeps you honest. Yeah. Shall I say, instead of like feeling like, hey, I'm up here, I got all this, I can do this, say this, whatever, you got to accept it and take it, you know, yeah. but she's just feeling like, I'm just one of you guys. I mean, I have this title, this, you know, but, you know, I'm still a human, I'm, I'm on the same level as you are. Once we're, you know, on that level, I, you know, she's increased her game, but still. Yeah, I think, I, I think I'm very sensitive to it, one, because she's my wife, obviously, and then number two, probably because I was probably not in my early years, humble enough, you know, I can go back and look and see how I dealt with things and things. And I try to learn from those behaviors before. So when I hear that, it's some of those things like, wait a minute, I already know this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, that just because I'm the loudest guy at the table doesn't make me, you know, uh, right. So the best process, the process about which a person is their influence, that's how I see it. So, you know, this is how you, so we know what power is, you know, but leadership is the process that you use to exert your influence. And that's it. There's a lot. That's why I brought that particular. There's a lot of ways of doing that, right? We've all worked for those great leaders that you just love to work for. You just love it when they tell you something to do. Uh, and then some people know they could tell you to breathe air and you just want to hold your breath <laughs> just because they say, because you know, they're just, they don't, they don't do it. Like, I'm not listening to you because you're just terrible. <laughs> so, so and the leader is an individual who's able to exert influence over other people. And we talked first class, the first class we had about managers and leaders, right? I see it as me personally, and you don't have to believe this one, but I just see it as we all manage things. At some point, you got to be a leader, right? And sometimes we do better at it than others, and, or at better times than, than other times. But um, and some roles call for more leadership than they do management, but both you have to do. Me, this is who I want to be. A servant leader has a strong desire to serve and work for the benefit of others. Am I a servant leader? I don't know. I, this, this is my desire, right, uh, where I tried to achieve. And then when you look up servant leader, we're getting all that. But that's where the humility comes in, understanding other people's stuff. I was talking about the last chapter. If you're looking at counseling and you want to get it right, then try to see what benefits that person. Sometimes, though, you'll, you'll find out, is you know, it might have already been there, but or you have you will one day as a leader you'll see what they're trying to achieve and then what your particular goal your company's goal is your whole team's goal they're not the same that's when the art of leadership comes in right you got to change something can you change your goal for them usually not can you get them to change what they're trying at so it's not all real easy sometimes now sometimes it's real easy because it's just me understanding what they're trying to get and if it allows them to reach the overall benefit and serve them in the organization, I can do both, but a lot of times I run into people who they're going this direction, and the organization needs to be going this direction. That's where the art again, the leadership comes in to marry those two up the best you can. So it jumps right into this because the leader's going to have to have managerial skills and, and authority, right? So here's the different sources of power for you as a manager or a leader expert, referent, legitimate, coercive, and reward. And we'll get into each one of these individually. Legitimate power. Anybody know what that is? Legitimate is the boss has the position. Uh, they have the rank, the position, or whatever. The authority that a manager has by virtue of his or her position in the firm. In the military, again, we wear that on our chest. You know, that's our rank that we have. That's your legitimate power. So if a person's a CEO, they have a certain amount of power. If they're your boss, they have a certain That's legitimate. Reward power can be the same as legitimate power. The same person can hold both, but not necessarily have to. The ability of a manager to give or withhold tangible or intangible benefits. This is where it gets complicated in workplaces sometimes, right? You have the boss hires and fires you and has the, you know, a lot of times that's the case. To hire or fire you and stuff and give you that raise or whatever, or promote you to that next position rather. That's the person with legitimate power. And sometimes they're one or two above you or three above you. And then you have people with reward of power in between them. The shift manager I mentioned before or boss who can let you off of work 
who can sign your leave slips, that kind of thing. So uh, sometimes it's the same person, sometimes it's not. Coercive power, the ability of a manager to punish others. Some people with kind of like reward also have the ability to create punishment for you, right? Can be the same person in all three or it can be broke out. If you want to look at this in the school environment, that would be your dean of students, right? Dean just punishes you. When I went to school, that's what the dean did, right? Principal did this other stuff, ran the whole school, teacher did this. The dean, he couldn't really reward me. <laughs> you know, didn't have legitimate power in school as far as being over me as a kid, right? Uh, if what I did in the classroom, that was up to the principal and the teachers, but he could he could paddle me. <laughs> so. Expert power. We don't have these in our industry, right? Based on special skills, knowledge, or expertise. That's that person that knows more than somebody in the room, right? We find this a lot of times, especially me being a manager and changing jobs, uh, actual positions in the military a lot. I run this all the time. I run into people that actually know a lot about what it is when I show up to manage, right? Uh, you might be expert in your own field. Uh, example, a computer program or something like that, right? They know it's, they got power because they understand everything about the computer and they fix it and get it going, right? Now, they're not the boss. They don't sign your leave or anything else, but they can make your machine work or not work. So they have a certain amount of power, right? Or there's a lot of different things you can, different examples you thought there's, um, based on, again, their expertise in this, in that field, the technical manager in that field, if you will. Comes from subordinates and coworkers. Oh, we missed one. I got that order. Sorry. Referent power. This comes from subordinates and coworkers' respect and admiration and loyalty. Right? It's that person has been there thirty years, twenty years, and everybody likes them, and you don't want to upset them. This is this this I see in church a lot. I got those guys. They don't really hold any formal position, but they've been there. Or, or ladies still know a couple ladies. I, yes, ma'am. You know when they say we ought to be doing this. They've been there forever, and uh, we admire, admire them and, and loyal to what they've done. So everybody's seen those, right? Makes sense as to what they are. Um, and you can probably think of examples in your work. All right, traits and personality characteristics related to effective leadership. Um, I won't get into the difference between trait and, and characteristics because the book doesn't. Um, but <laughs> they lump them together. But these are the things that leaders should have to be effective in some form or fashion. And see if y'all agree with them. So you can jump in at any time. Intelligence. You need to be intelligent, right? Helps managers understand complex issues and solve problems. We also know you gotta have knowledge and expertise in the field, all right? Dominance. Helps manage and influence their subordinates to achieve organizational goals. What do y'all think about that one? I don't like that word. It just don't sound good to me. Is that a? No, I don't do like to like this. Yeah. When I update to the new version, I hope they got that word changed. I doubt they have, but uh, I see what they're saying. And that's kind of like what my wife's boss, I think, is getting at with her. But I don't, that book says it, but I mean, there it is. It's a trait. Self-confidence now. I like that one. High energy. Yeah, depends on what you do, <laughs> you know, and, and how it's portrayed. I mean, I guess it's how you define that one. Uh, tolerance for stress is a huge one. I learned this one the hard way uh, after 40 is, is my techniques are the same, but uh, also my habits were the same. So uh, physically, I couldn't. Oh, we're going to show on the screen. I'll fix it for you one second, Thomas. Um, tolerance uh, for stress is a lot of times related to your physical fitness, right? So I, I still ate the same and I still worked out or didn't work out, <laughs> should say, the same. And then as I got older, it, it affected me. So I actually work out more, eat better just because of my age uh, and because my stress levels. Like, why am I getting stressed now? You know? Let me see how I can get that to share. Oh, your screen sharing is paused. Can you see them now, Thomas? 
Hmm. What am I doing? All right. Make the step paused. Oh. There we go. Let me get on the right slide for you. Yeah, it's cold in there, isn't it? Yeah, I lost you again, Tom. So I'm trying to get them up where they're they're synced. All right, now I can get it. Chapter fourteen. Oh, there we go. There we go. The problem is, Thomas, there we go. Still up? There we go. There we go. Still up, Thomas? 60, yep, okay. Sorry about that. Me and my screen, he texted me, telling me I didn't have those up. Apologize for that, Thomas. Um, integrity and honesty. I think that's very big. Yes. Um, and then maturity. Uh, the book says maturity. Uh, I want to replace that one. Uh, won't matter because it's not going to be on the test, but I'll replace it with emotional intelligence. Right? It's a more precise definition. I've seen some really good leaders that do really good things, uh, but they lack emotional intelligence. Uh, they can't control their emotions. Athletes are famous a lot of times for this. Um, understand after a game, I'm talking about, so I'm not talking about like saying something after a game because you're all fired up for a game. I'm talking about uh, they just seem to never make that cross, you know, and they act pretty immature, we'd say, but really what that boils down is to controlling their emotions. You know, the ones controlled during the game help too. Politicians, one particular one on the stage right now, uh, whether you like him or not, I think you can easily say his emotional intelligence, not necessarily. That's where he kind of would lack if you want to pick out a trait that he lacks. And obviously, a good leader as far as effectiveness and getting things done, I mean, done a lot of good things. But reality is that at least they show that, at least it comes across that way to me, is my personal opinion. Um, so most intelligence, I think, is really huge. Something that um, when I read that definition, wanted to be a servant leader and got after it, uh, I got to thinking about that. I really have to work on emotional intelligence, especially when you want to help someone. Because when you want to get emotionally, and they say things, you know, you don't get let your emotions be that reaction. So I try to break it out a lot more logically and work it that way. So to me, emotional intelligence is huge versus and it's, it's, it's basically, it's one of the books Lowell is uh, saying the same things with emotional intelligence. Is. But maturity, we've been overused and we've weakened that word, right? So I like emotional intelligence a little better. All right, behavior model uh, consideration. Behavior indicating that a manager's trust, respects, and cares about the subordinates. I think we all want that out of a leader, right? Then we all want to be that kind of leader, at least I hope we do. Now, there might be some that don't, but. Then the initiating structure behavior that managers engage in ensure that work gets done, subordinates perform their jobs acceptably, and the organization is effective, efficient, and effective. I mean, obviously between the two, uh, I want you to be considerate if you're my boss, right? But contingency models, whether or not a manager is an effective leader, is the result of the interplay between what the manager is like, what he does, and the situation in which leadership takes place. So this is just simple. It's just contingent on what the leader does. I agree with it to an extent. Leadership matters, without a doubt. But when we talk to the very first of the class, whose responsibility to motivate people? Partly the leaders, but if people become unmotivated, what can you do, all right? Now, you still do the things that are right. You still click along and, and you you can isolate them or, you know, help them get rid of them. But um, 
So you still have a role to play, but the success of that, uh, as it puts it, your effectiveness is on you, it is, but don't be too hard of a judge or too easy of a judge. You can't, I see it go both ways sometimes because, you know, they take the contingency model. Well, it's not my fault because they're not motivated or whatever, but I see it the other way too. Well, we failed and that's my fault. Coaches miss this one a lot. Do they not in post interviews? Sometimes they blame everything else in the world. A lot of times they blame themselves. Now, a lot of that might just be for show because it sounds cool to say, I got to do better as a coach. And it went well. If they practice right and everything else. The player just made a mistake, you know. So, old feelers contingency theory. It's just uh, relationship-oriented, and it, you don't have to get into it too much. But basically, um, based off your uh, – Relation to the task, your structure, and your position. If you if you've got the right relationship with your team members, you have the right structure, and you have the right position and power, then you'll be favorable. The situation will come out favorable. If you have low in all of those things over here on the left, it come out unfavorable. That's really all that boils down to. Pretty simple, but it's bears looking at because no, you're not only know yourself as far as what your weaknesses and strengths are or what, you're, what you bring to the table, or just at least your characteristics. Weaknesses and strengths is, hard, is a bad way really of putting it. Know your capabilities and, and, and what you bring to the table, but also know where you actually sit in that landscape, right? Understand if you don't have a good relation, even though you want a good relation with your employees or people you're working with or your teammates, understand that before you ever go in there and spout off or do things. Understand or don't not do things because you can't do that in your mind because it wouldn't be appropriate, but you got a good relationship where you probably could. Know the task structure and then also know what really, man, do we miss this one a lot or I've seen people in my industry do this, their real position, their power. What, I, what am I really responsible for? What is my position here? What authority do I have here? So then if you really break it down logically like that, and all of those things are favorable, this says, Fiedler says, should come out favorable. If they're not, it probably won't. The so what of that is, before you go into the situation, think in those terms, though. I mean, you don't have to think the chart, but, you know, what is my relationship with this team before I go in there and speak with them? I've missed my audience many of times, right? I'm, I overestimated my relationship with the team, and I shouldn't have presented things the way I presented it. Task structure, you know, does it lend itself? Is it done correctly? Can I fix it or do I have to deal with that? I'm gonna have to change the way I interact with people. And then am I fixing things that I really can't fix because I don't have the authority to fix it? Or am I not fixing things because that's actually my job? Am I getting, am I actually doing what my job is? That's a way to use this in practical world. Good theory to know. Possible substitutes can be found in uh, the, the leader substitute model. Characteristics of subordinates, their skills, experience, motivation, characteristics, context, the extent to which work is interesting and fun. So it says you can make up with those things. Pretty simple. All right. Charismatic leader, enthusiastic, enthusiastic self confident, transformational leader, able to clearly communicate his vision of how good things could be. I would agree, um, but I think you can be charismatic and not transformational. We studied old um, Iger. Uh, well, the other students did, I guess. That was our discussion question with the Bob Iger. I don't know if you read it in your book. CEO of Walt Disney. He was a uh, transformational leader. Don't know how charismatic he was. They're tying these two together. I see charismatic as a term of, of being liked and outgoing and that thing. As long as you tie these two together, then the definition holds sense, you know, holds true. I, I think you can be one without the other, but that's okay. Developmental consideration manager supports and encourages uh, subordinates giving the opportunity to enhance their skills, capabilities, and grow and excel on the job. So this is what I was talking about. And this goes into serving leadership is you want to give people the opportunity to enhance their skills and their capabilities. That makes sense. If we do that, then we're probably reaching it why you need you as a manager. 
if you're only telling people what to do, you gotta wonder why you're making more money to do that. At least I do. Because I get anybody to tell other people what to do, right? I mean, I know that someone's gotta make sure people do stuff, but why is it worth consideration for more money to my company? Well, it's not. You know, you just make positions and pay everybody the same. Uh, if you are developing your employees to make them more effective for the company in the longer term, and then that's really where you get into becoming why the company needs you or the organization needs you, right? I mean, I imagine in your own personal business, you prefer the people who come to work for you in that building are profitable, right? Because if everybody in there was not you're always having that turnover, it's not going to be good for you. So you probably have some kind of criteria that you're looking for at a minimum for them to come in there and work, right? Even though you let them do it themselves. And then probably when you have the opportunity, you can develop them because that's just better for you and everybody else. Same way in your job, somebody comes to work for you or school or wherever you're at, it doesn't matter. The more you can develop people under you, that's really what management's about for me. So it's good, good definition. Um, but I think that's what the difference is, not just being a boss. Transactional leaders, leadership that motivates subordinates by rewarding them for high performance and reprimanding them for low performance. I try to stay out of the scale, All right? I try to not be that guy who just says, good job when you did a good job, and then you see me when you do a bad job. It, sometimes that's necessary and it has to happen, but I don't want to be that, that's not how I want you to see me as a leader. It's important because you got to have the transactions and you got to do those things. But if our only interaction is that, when you do something good, you see me, and when you do something bad, you see me, how do I know that I'm getting the best out of you? And then how are you going to trust me when I come up with that new thing we want to do? So you've been doing this for five years, the same way that you've always done it, right? And the company decides to take a left turn on something, you know, we need to be a transformational company and we got to make that next leap. So I come to my team and the only time you really see me in any meaningful interaction is I've told you good job for what you've been doing or recommend you when you did bad. Now I'm going to tell you something completely different we need to do. You're going to be a little uneasy because you're going to remember that reprimand when things didn't go right. You're going to see this not going right, right? Because change is hard, right? So it's hard to be a transformational leader if you're only transactional. Does that make sense? So this is where it comes. This is really the crux of leadership is where this comes into play. I'm sorry about that. I, um, this is where this comes into play. If, if you are working with them and enhancing their skills every day and helping develop them, right, each day, if you're going to get them towards their own goals, and then I come in and you've known me now for these five years and we've had transactions, but you also know that because of what you've said and done with me, I've gotten from here to here, right? And then say, look, we got to take this left turn and we got to do something completely different. You're a lot more apt to follow that. You're not going to remember that. Does that, do you see where that comes into buy into it? Give you a, a real good example. Uh, again, I hate to go back to politics, but that's what's in my world right now. It throws up there. Is both candidates on both sides right now are trying to reach a different type of people group right now. Well, they got 44 days, 55 days, what is for an election? That's kind of hard to do. Because all they've been before is transactional, not transformational. Because they, you know, now you might see one of them completely transformational. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying each group, when they speak back, this is what I hear them saying. Well, yeah, sounds good. Where was he at last year? Where was she at last year? That kind of thing, right? And it's not as elementary as that sounds. What did you just do for me lately? Really what we're getting at is it's really tough if you've only been transactional with someone. Like I said, you still got to be transactional as a leader. It's a good definition, but that's not the only realm you want to operate in. Right. And I know folks here, I mean, they are, they've, I've been scoffed many times by my peers and superiors for why would you waste time with a relationship with them? Them being my employees, subordinates. Because that was the way we were kind of taught in the model. Well, I don't know. It just seems what I want to do and be right. But man, did it pay dividends when I wanted to be a change agent, right? People trust and were able to 
at least see what, you know, believe that we can go that way. Yeah, you know, like I said, it's real tough if you don't. I ain't always done that. I ain't been great at it. I'm just saying the times that I have, that's when it worked well. And I've certainly been on that other end, coming with a great idea or told a new idea that I had to, to lead and transform things, and they've only seen me as a transactional leader. Like I said, no one ever raises their hand and goes, no, wait a minute, you're only transactional. But that's really what they're saying. They're like, well, yeah, but this don't go right. And when you hear that, that that's them telling you that, they didn't see you as that kind of person to, to change things. So those are, those are important. We flew through leadership, but it's, um, uh, don't get too much in for the next class. It's really what that boils down to. Uh, good principles in there though. Good stuff. Any questions on leadership? All right, Thomas, as I mentioned before, this chapter, I lost those slides. So, uh, I'm going to go out of the book, okay? So there won't be any slides up on the screen. We'll get through this one pretty quick, too. And then we'll go to test. Chapter 15, teams. Anybody know about teams? What do y'all think about teams? They can be good and they can be bad. If you want to grab your book, Thomas, it might help. I'll let you know what page we're going through. The reason I say that, the reason I say that, team can be good or bad because working on a team, you're only as good as your weakest counterpart, you know? That's true. That's and true. then if everybody's churning and doing what they're supposed to be doing, then it's, you know, like, for example, y'all know. <laughs> I work in customer service, so like it's me, uh, one of the other guys that work with me, he take like the, mo the bulk of the calls like a day. Like, we in the, it's not that high, like 30, in between 35 and 40 calls. And you have some people that take like 15 calls like in a, in a day. And we're like, 15 calls? How you take 15 calls? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Seriously. But she'll, the, the, the person that does it, she'll come to a meeting and talk about stuff that she don't even need to be researching because she's not an analyst, first of all. But she'll sit there and research stuff, take off the phone like for two or three hours researching some stuff. Like she trying to, like she an analyst or something. So, you're, okay. So, yeah, I'll let that ride. Playing the harp about it. So, I mean, we're a team, we're a unit, we're working as, as customer service reps. You need to be put on that, putting out that same output, you know, 25, 30. And teams are reality. You're going to have to deal with them. So the book, we're talking about some principles of teams. Um, this won't be your fix for them, but if you understand the dynamics of a team, it might help with that at least. Um, um, so I think that um, teams in school work, and I did that in my master's. They put us in groups. I told you that before. I hated that. They let me do it myself. Somebody didn't show up. Yeah, so I'll never teach that away. I wrote things um, afterwards in my, you know, um, evaluations that I didn't want to be a team. Now, some things lend themselves. I'm not against the teamwork. It could have been me. But I never got much as much out of it as I wanted to. I did have one person, one of my workers, work workers, but, uh, peers of mine, she said it during the class. She wrote a, in there an email to the instructor. And uh, I, I was bold. I wasn't going to do that. I was just going to go with the teams. And it worked. It worked. We got out of it. Yeah. yeah. She did it. I, I commend her for being brave. She's always been that way. And she just said, it. hey, uh, it's not working for me. So, anyway, teams and groups. So, uh, But we want to talk to them in the business sense. So a group is defined as two or more people, right? And then a uh, team should have some synergy to it. What does synergy mean? Synergy? Mm-hmm. It's performance gains that result when individuals and departments coordinate their actions. So if you want to move from a group, just two or more people, and this is, you know, and, and be a team, at least by the sense of the definition of working together, you need some synergy. So uh, skip over. Let's look at um, figure 15 one on 468. This is what groups and teams can. 
It can enhance performance, increase responsiveness to customers. That's what you're talking about. Increase innovation, increase motivation and satisfaction. All of this will lead you to gain an A competitive advantage, right? That's what we want to get after. That's what you want a team to do. And we'll talk a little bit about what, at the end, what teams, how they can go bad. We're going to flip ahead. 15-2. Types of groups and teams and organizations. Okay. Um, cross-functional teams, cross-cultural, top management, research and development, command groups, task forces, self-manage, and virtual teams. These are all formal ones. Okay. So, um, the informal groups are friendship groups and interest groups. Are they important to your organization? The friendship and the interest group? Mm -hmm. mm. Yes and no. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a yes and a no to that. So, I'll, I'll throw some out here as a, as a manager. Whether they're, whether, you got some Yeah, well, I was going to say, Go yeah, ahead. like with like managers trying to be like, I guess, in that friend group with all their employees, that's that's not always a, a good thing, you know. Um, we had a had a situation where uh, our supervisor or whatever, um, she always wanted to be involved in some of the little things that we would do outside of work. Well, it ended up turning around, we're trying to bit it in the butt because uh, some of the other employees, you know, uh, didn't care for it too much. And they took the stuff that we would do when we probably hang out and try to use it in, within the company, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? In a negative way. Yeah, that's not good. So yeah, that friendship thing is lies you can't cross in certain positions, you know. Exactly. So we'll talk about it in the form of as a manager that uh, there will be groups that are that are, have the same interest or their friends in your organization. And as a manager, hopefully you're not necessarily a part of formally in that group or informally of that group, I should say. But you need to know that they're there and exist and how to kind of deal with it. Uh, give a quick example. I made sure that um, later on in my career that I made sure I didn't try to interject myself into those groups because I wanted to be liked or, or I wanted to find out things I never knew that anyway. But that would be a bad way. But realizing they need their space away from so they can talk about me or the process or whatever. <laughs> it's the truth, and that's perfectly fine. So my example was this. I had in this very building a group of people. We had two or three separate groups that did separate things. I had one group that always went out to eat. Like they did every Friday, the fish thing. And they did all their lunches and had their little spots. I had another group they always ate in that. My break room down there. They ate in there and brought their lunch. And then on Wednesdays, I took the officers out. And so I made we went ate Blue Coast Burrito because I like Blue Coast Burrito and I need to talk to the leaders just as a mentorship thing you come and go in. Um, so I made sure on that Wednesday I did that with those guys. But about once a month or so, I made for sure that I had brought my lunch. I don't know why I paid for me a lunch. She's like, happy because I'm not spending money on that. But I'd go in there and eat lunch. And they watch Jeopardy and I happen to like, have a lot of useless knowledge so I can play some Jeopardy now. And uh, I tear them up on some Jeopardy. And uh, but we do Jeopardy and sitting there just eating and talking and throwing out answers. Uh, but I do that by once a month, once every other week, something like that. The other group invites there, I can go, they're polite, we got along well, it's a good organization, good camaraderie, but I did, I did the fish Fridays once a month. That's about it, I didn't intrude on the other lunch time. I understood they existed, but I didn't ignore the group. I've done both, I've, I've been with them too much, and then other groups see that as well, he's on their side. Right, or then then they get they're rolling their eyes because they're, I, they're the one group's having to deal with me all the time. We got the Boston ones all the time. Whereas he won't eat at it. I can't say what I want to say because you know. And then right, we, right. So so I made sure, and I did as a manager. I took conscious effort to make sure that I didn't ignore any one group. Understood they were there, gave them their own time, but also show up. You know with them uh, uh, and, and eat or do whatever they were in their groups. Uh, when they had things and little parties at their houses or this or that, didn't know what it was. For example, they have a, a interest group or they're gonna go do a skeet shoot or a barbecue at their house or something. 
you know, if it's scheduled and it's like three or four hours, I wouldn't be the first one there and I certainly wouldn't be the last one to leave. I would try to always bring my spouse with me, my wife with me, just so to break that social size so they don't see boss there, right? Because I can't act the same as she's there anyway. So you don't want to hear all that word stuff. So, you know, so those are the kind of things in, in groups that this one part where it breaks them up, I thought was interesting and doesn't get into it a whole lot, but that's my take on that. No other groups exist. It's good to be a part of them. No, interesting enough, my wife's boss is, used to be their friend in another group, right? And now she can't be in that group anymore. She pulled herself away from it on purpose, which was good. But now she's going to, she's feeling lonely because it's lonely at the top. So she must started back. She just got the job. She's going to hang out with them. And they're, they're the ones going, we don't want her here. <laughs> all the way to the point, because I'm talking about school, but all the way to the point, she moved all of the um, department heads right around her instead of out there with their people. How you set your people up and where they set it, if you have that ability, is a kind of a big deal. And she says it out loud, kind of like, the, what I do like about her, she does say what she thinks. Humility is not a leadership trait. She said, I don't want to mind her talking about me because when she was a department head, that's what they did, they talked about the boss. So she moved them all where they couldn't. Well, they don't stop them, right? What do they do? I come home, I hear the ding, ding, ding on the phone. And my wife's like, oh, they're saying this, they're saying this. I'm like, don't respond, stay out of the activity. But, uh, right, so you can't prevent it, but that's the, the, so how you set people up is kind of big, right? Where you want to set them out, their groups and stuff. I always try to be close to the people I work with or I have the department managers with them versus close to me, right? If I can't, that's me. But anyway, that's the groups. Uh, of course, these are different teams. You know, you got, you can, they're almost self-explanatory by the name and you can read them. A task force, you know, what's the difference in task force and a team? There you go. Really a time set specific. So we use task force a lot, not just the military term, we use them everywhere. Sometimes the term gets overused and they're actually really just a team if they're reoccurring or getting something done. But uh, yeah, task force is a specific thing there. Self managed work teams. <laughs> Man, I, <laughs> I grew up different from that one, right? They used to manage themselves and stuff. Um, I've always had specific goals and stuff put on us in times, but uh, I can see them working. All right, let me flip through and quickly. What else I did? All right, group development over time. Sometimes when the instructor uh, knocks on the desk, that means it's on a test. So, so that was that one. Uh, group development over time. So there's five stages of group development. Don't overlook these. I said these out in a, in a church meeting uh, in, a, in a task force that we were on, and they looked at me like I had three heads. But I said, you know, we they, they, they try to jump right into performing. So you got to form the group, then you got a storm, then you got a norm, then you perform, then you adjourn. Right? Now, here's what I mean. You've got to spend time figuring out how many people need to be on the team. Put some thought in that. I mentioned this a couple classes ago. Churches are bad about this. We got this project. Who wants to be on this team? And sister so and so and brother so and so jump on it and they got no business. Next thing you know, you got a team of 15 people on it. What size should a team be? I did it. Uh, come on, if you mean what type of setting? Uh, you're some, uh, Just in normal. I mean, if you got to work a team in a group four together, four, four to six. I said yeah, four, four to six. six. Yeah, I would say that. Three to five, four to six, seven's kind of getting up there. Uh, uh, Twelve's a lot. Two's not enough. Three's mm -hmm. kind of tough. You know, right. now that's just a general term, but think about those things when you form the team, right? And then who should be on the team? Don't just buy who wants to be. If you're a leader, think about that. What are you trying to accomplish? Who brings what to the team? Right. Um, next thing would be is brainstorming. You ever see them get in there and then somebody's got this idea and you just start fixing the problem immediately. That's what my group was doing earlier and I had a slow amount. So let's, let's go back to brainstorming. Spend the five minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, just writing down everybody's ideas and they're all valid. Norming. So group norms, what do we mean by group norms? Just uh, everybody being on the kind of same page of guidelines of what's going on. Yeah. That's the, exactly. Y'all got this set idea. 
with which I'll yeah. pass without trying to handle it. Yeah, and that, I've seen groups do this. They try to norm before they storm. And man, is that frustrating. <laughs> right? Because I got all these ideas in my head. And then you want to come up with my guidelines and things to follow. And all I'm thinking about is all this other stuff that I'm thinking about. Right? And you're, you're basically putting left and right fences around me. And I'm just not a fence kind of guy. So it's important that you go in order. And most people that way because you're like excited about hopefully excited about being on the group and you bring something to the tables while you're here. So you form it and you tell them why you formed it. You're obviously, then you let them get all that energy out. <laughs> um, my dad used to do that with my hunting dogs. Before we go hunting, he let them run all night. Now all the books tell you not to do that. But I'm telling you that worked. You know, that was his brainstorming. Them dogs would run around. They show back up about four in the morning. We'd be ready with about five with them. They were focused. Really? Yeah. Well, get all that jitter out of them. Yeah. Because they get fired up, right? Yeah. Same thing when you get in a group. I mean, people have got a lot of energy when they first come and a lot of ideas. So you brainstorm right all that. And you keep that. It's not just to, uh, to patronize them. You, you keep all that because you'll go back to that. It'll be good stuff. Then you norm, which again is setting the guidelines of behavior that the group must follow. After they've talked for 30 minutes or an hour and wrote it all down, then, then you decide as a group to. You, know, you got that one leader. It's not much of a team if you got that your boss is on the team and he's telling you everything to do. I've done that. I pulled him aside, sat around, start telling them, man, one guy's smart enough to tell me, hey boss, this is we might as well go back to where we were working at to do this. It's the same thing. <laughs> you telling me what to do. <laughs> if we're gonna work as a team, you need to shut up and let me tell you what I think. Right? That's, that would be a team. You can manage the team. This is not where you necessarily need the leadership. You need it. To, to set this up, but during the process, they need to see you as a team member. So you norm, you come up with that, then you start performing. And man, I've been part of this, always set a deadline to stop. The team, when are we done? When are we done for today? And stick to that. And how long should a meeting go? Uh, 30 minutes to around. 60 to 90. 60 to 90. Two at the most. Yeah, I said the minimum to at the max. At the max, I set most all my meetings, and we were in man. I set them for an hour, and all all out it's about the fifteen mark, and I quit. Uh, yes, you can definitely go to big ones that my bosses and stuff were involved in. We'd have to go to two, we couldn't get it in. But if I'm sitting and running, yeah, I go at an hour mark. I it takes discipline because you have to write down everything you want to talk about. So that's like I'll get in the classroom. I set my agenda and then we'll get off on side subjects and I'll point a guy to do it a lot of times because I'm a chatty guy. So I'll point my a guy that says, we're off this subject. You stop me. And we go right back on target. Or I'd say, that's a great idea. I've come out of meetings or whatever. And we have three or four more meetings. Good stuff. Hang on to that. Let's write that down. Call it the parking bin. You sing that over there and write it down. I just write it in my notes, but. Let's write that down. Let's not forget about that, but let's not talk about it right here. Got to have a distinct agenda. Don't have a meeting with a group and a team. If you're in there, there that's part of your norming. If you don't set that time each time before you ever show up, right? We're going to be at an hour. We're going to be at two. If you want to make it five or six or all day, that's fine. But I wouldn't recommend, but, but that's kind of what you're looking at. Uh, so then you got conformity and uh, deviance. So, this is what the book says, and I agree with it. It just takes some, takes some thought, I think. It took some thought for me, I should say. A certain amount of deviance is good. Deviance is not bad. Conformity is good, but too much of it is bad. Does that make sense? So if you look at figure 15.5, page 482, you want to achieve that certain amount in the middle. You don't want, like we talked about before, groupthink, right? What you want is a good balance. You want people with different ideas and that are deviating, right? Um, and then you want people who uh, also conform. And it's not one person is a, deviates and one conforms. You want it kind of both. And we're talking about when we get to the idea making and your performing part. Not about the part of, we'll get to in a minute, someone not showing up, right? Or leaving early or showing up late or not contributing. So when we talk about conformity and deviance in groups on this, well, that's what that's talking about. 
right? That's talking about your ideas and how you perform. And you want to hit that balance. You know, we want to be able to see all angles and talk about it, but not to the point where, you know, it's always that one person that's going to argue every single thing, right? You can't be devil's act on everything yeah, every time. Kind of like the devil and right. But you don't want complete conformity either. Like, oh, if we just all agree with you, and we talk about juries being like that, right? You don't want to do that. So that's the two in there. So then we'll slip over to group cohesion. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead of that because the book should have put it in this order. Go to 488, then we'll come back to the other one. So the, when we talk about conformity and deviance, they're not bad, they're not good, okay? You just need the right balance of both of them. They're just it. That's what they are. They're there. But social loafing in the group is bad. Does that make sense? So when people are – so what I've had in the past, the reason I'm hitting my desk on this one, students have mixed up the conformity – and we'll get to application versus knowledge base and think deviance is bad because it sounds bad and mix it up with social loafing, right? Deviance is not bad. Conformity is not good. They just are. You just got to have the right balance. Social loafing, loafing is a bad behavior. That's the tendency, as the book says, of individuals to put forth less effort when they work in groups, uh, more so than they work alone. This is what we see at the college level a lot of times in them groups, right? You got stuck in sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, well, you know. I'm going to be anyway by A and B. Depending on what the group that I ain't going to be too much in Exactly. There you go. Yeah. That's social loafing. That That's why I, I, not that groups are bad because groups are good. We said they can get a competitive advantage in the academic setting, and they're probably still good because you have to do that. And there's a lot of good things that come out of collaboration, learning, and all of that. But when you give a project to them, you got to know this. And same thing with your team. Social loafing can occur. The problem with teacher student is, is hard because to change social loafing in, a, in that group from teacher student in a very short amount of time. As a manager, understand that it's there and you can probably change and do those things. Social loafing will almost always occur if you don't follow the steps. Not because people are being lazy, but because they're going to get frustrated and it's going to cost them. So again, if you start off in a group and you're not, you don't allow them to get their say out first of what they think they should be there for, which also could pay a lot of dividends. So I've sat down in meetings and people tell me why they think they're there. And I'm like, that is 180 from what you're actually supposed to be bringing to the team. We need to talk about that <laughs> before we go any further, right? If you think you're on the team to contribute X, Y, and Z, well, no, we need A, B, and C, right? And then we have to come to an agreement. So that's all part of your storming part of it. If you skip that part and go right to trying to get them to norm to you, then, you know, you'll get into some social love. You know, you've been there and you've been shut down. You got all these ideas that shut you down. All right. Sit back and you ain't you know, yeah. The rest of them, you're meeting three or four now and you're like, well, I mean, you know, you might come alive when they get to where what you wanted to say, but they don't let you. So social loafing is uh, different. And then the book gets into some ways to, uh, uh, to reduce it. Uh, make individual contributions to the group identifiable, right? So now, sometimes this goes this way, especially when you're doing the academic setting. I'll do the first paragraph, right? I'll do this, or I'll do the first check, this, and then you do this, and you do this, and let's leave. And everybody leaves, and you come back together. That's not really what that's saying to do. It'll help, because they know they've got it. But the problem is, you come back, four of us come back together, somebody didn't do their part. Didn't do their part. <laughs> right it's it's best that you can kind of get that in that group uh but you want to make it at least identifiable right uh so that's that's a good stab at it like you do this this and this but but then also what you get is a very choppy things that, that they don't go together uh emphasize the valuable contributions of individual members so when they bring something you just need to tell them it was good keep group size at the appropriate level we talked about group size and that's 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 actually how you reduce yourself social open the tendencies there and it was saying there's a tendency that means that's it's going to happen or at least it should if you do nothing it will that's why we take the time to go back to uh setting the groups up so go back to 44 group craziness this is what causes the group um cohesiveness the size needs to be correct for the task. And you mentioned it, I mean, it depends on what your task is. Because some groups, we say, you know, 
uh, uh, you know, said four to six, I think that's it right on. But some groups would, might just require more than that, right? Um, some task. Effectively manage diversity. We talked about this earlier, but again, I can't overemphasize this. You have to be purposeful in the thought of why you want the person on the team, right? And when I say diversity, I'm not saying let's pick this person because they look different, although that certainly can help a lot of things if you got people, because chances are they might think different. But in a group that you're picking at work, I would hope, and this is not always the case, that you're already in a diverse workplace. What you're wanting here is you want to manage your, uh, it effectively. What you're looking for is do I have the right mix of the type of people who think the right way, right? And you can find through um, Myers-Briggs, and that's why they do that, these little personality tests, and we do a small portion of one. Um, you can find people who look different than you who think just like you, and people who look like you who think completely different. You see that in your family, will you not? I mean, I got my brother and me look alike, but we think a lot different on a lot of things. So we would be good in a group together just for the fact of the way we see things, right? So when we say manage diversity um, effectively, diversity is huge and key in like hiring and doing that right and, and making sure that you do it when it comes to differences in, in the way we look, that's one thing. But we're getting into groups, it's, this is really, really, really what we're getting after is, is how the, the thought was looking at. Group identity uh, and healthy competition. Yeah. Group can have a name or a purpose in the name and then have a little bit of competition or some stuff that's good to an extent. I work in, a, in, a, in an environment, the current job I'm in for two more weeks is full of a bunch of alphas. So that's scary to me. You know, when we, anytime we set up competition, because everybody's trying to beat everybody, I, I'm not, I, I just, I, I'm different on, on that thought process. So uh, it's good in, in groups where, you know, people are that way, or, or not all, everybody's there. And then look for success. Um, oh, by the way, I've seen that commercial about, I forgot what they're advertising. I saw last night, let me write that down. But there, it's a group, and they were at work, and they're passive aggressive. You haven't seen it. Mm. And everything they say is very passive aggressive. And because uh, 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 they're saying about each other and they're very, they're, you know, you give the compliment, but it's an insult. Right, right. I've seen it. Yeah, it looks it really is. don't matter. You just, oh, that's a very smart statement. You prove looks don't, are not everything, Tim. That's what they say, you know. So she's calling him ugly, even though he said something smart, you know. The whole group is that. I made me think of this one. But anyway, it's, it's, it's a good commercial. I forgot what they're advertising. I'm not good to advertise on because I just I see those things on. I don't know that I've ever bought a product because the commercial was good. Maybe I have. Maybe I just didn't know I did. Like I love Snickers commercials, but I've ate Snickers before there was ever a commercial. So. But that's group cohesion. Is that's what you try to achieve. These are the things that you need to think about. And then of course social loafing. That's groups. Any questions, concerns? All right. I know what, what I'll do is, if y'all want me to, is I will pull up the test where y'all can't see it. And I'll make sure we hit all of those, okay? I'm going to do that. If I can figure this out. Oh, I don't want to do share. Get away. Because if I shared it, y'all would see the test and you'd be like, man, you gave me the test. Y'all yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we talked about decision making models right so you need to understand the ones in there in the book um, don't know if I actually go back to that one yeah it is it's in there too real easy to find um, how we make decisions intuition, that kind of stuff. Oh, wait a minute. I'm up on your test. I'm sorry. I'm going over the old test. I pulled you up because I fixed two of our answers. I was, I was sitting there. I was like, yeah, I know it, it all runs together with me when you teach it all. I, 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 pulled, up the wrong, I pulled up the wrong web study. Here we go. I'm sorry. I pulled her test up earlier because she rightfully showed me where she had capitalized the word. It did not be capitalized according to the thing that grades it. 
That's what I had to fix it for. Everybody else should see, does everybody see their corrections that were made on your test if there's any? Should have saw those. Again, I, I've tried, I, I, I fix it every time to make it even more, but when you make your own test and, they, and you go through web study, that's what it does to you. Now, I'm sorry, I got the right one up now. So we want to, um, how do I do this without giving the whole answer? We want to talk about, you want to know about uh, behavior modification when you get to that chapter, that portion of the chapter in 13. Um, you want to know about it. You want to know about uh, equity theory. You'll want to be able to identify where someone sits on uh, Maslow's uh, hierarchy. Pyramid. So if you know that before you get to it, it'll be a lot easier than trying to read during the test. So when you see the scenario I'll give you, you should be able to pick it out. You want to know um, the next chapter, I believe. No, same chapter. Uh, work motivation. The theories, we'll know about inputs, performance, and outcomes. The different types of power, right? Legitimate, reward, coercive, referent. Be able to identify those. The leadership traits, be able to identify them. The types of leaders, for example, like a relationship or in the leader versus the other kind. Transformational managers, know about them. And of course, you're gonna know about social loafing, we just went over, and then the how to set up a group, storming, norming, forming, <laughs> storming, norming, forming, and enduring. But test scores have all been pretty good. Y'all find in the test question, you see what I'm talking about, knowledge base versus application base, you're reading a little paragraph, and then going in this test, it's gonna be even heavier on it. To uh, recap, papers are gonna be due the next Thursday, a week from today. If you'll give me by Tuesday your uh, rough draft or a draft, any sort, I will look over for you and make my thoughts about it so you have some chance to, to I would take advantage of that, that way you can you know, see where you're at on it. I'll let you know those things. Don't be upset if there's a bunch of red on there. It's just be stuff to fix. Um, be ready to present on your PowerPoint. And I will put up in the next day or two the slides with me talking over them for the last three chapters. And we will, for the last class, that's all we'll do. And then everything will be due on Sunday on that. Everybody following. So we won't have a lecture unless y'all so desire and say, hey, we want to sit here for another hour and a half lecture. I'll be glad to. Um, so it'll be another test. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We've got the same thing. You got Here's what you got left. Got a test. You got an assignment. Okay. Got two of each because like, unless you've done now, you got week four and week five, and they're all the same. So week four, you'll assign it, you'll uh, um, a uh, test. Week five, you'll assign it, you'll a test, and you'll a paper. That's why I say if you want to throw me your draft of where you're at, it'll kind of help you and kind of let you focus. So next two or three days, because you got to Sunday, this should be completed for week four. Then you've got the rest of the time to work on your paper, and then you got to the following Sunday to get the assignments done. The paper's due on Thursday. So we're kind of hitting that that break hit us at the wrong time in my mind, but it is what it is. So that's where we're at. Um, do not forget about the survey. It's open now. You can wait to the end of the class. That's fine. 
um, but it's open, so fill that out if you don't mind. Um, and then there's a video on there, uh, the devotional, so watch that too. It's the two things that totally remind you of to do. All right, any questions? Thank you all very much. I will see you all back on Thursday and hope I see your, uh, your drafts. Thank you, Thomas. Any questions? All right, see you, bro. Take it easy, guys. All right, have a good night. Huh? That's mine. It was rain when I came in. All right, give me a week three, okay? Okay, let's see. Matt, no, you're just going back to work. <laughs> <laughs> you got to open the house tonight. Oh, goodness.